We're in the, uh, <clears throat> this Beatitudes, this eight-week study of the eight Beatitudes. It's, uh, and we're, it's found in Matthew chapter 5. And today we're looking at the fifth Beatitude. And it's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 7. Matthew 5, verse number 7. And it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Everybody say it again. Repeat it and say, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. See, now you've already memorized one of the Beatitudes. You only got seven more to go, okay? <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So you only got seven more to go. So the Beatitudes really reveal the personality of Jesus. This is the personality of Jesus that we're looking at. Beatitudes come with in Jesus. Jesus didn't travel to India and talk to some guru, okay? They come from within Jesus, and they are the examination of the interior biography of Jesus' heart, these Beatitudes right here. They are his personality, so we know from the Beatitudes that Jesus is for the poor, the sorrowful, the meek, and the persecuted. He endorses justice and mercy, purity and peacemaking, and if we attempt to understand Jesus apart from these Beatitudes, we're going to get Jesus wrong. And I think sometimes we've done that. We've sort of got Jesus wrong, all right? But here, is, here comes the big point of the message today. God is like Jesus. God is like Jesus. I want you to get that. God is like Jesus, and that's what the incarnation is all about. God is like Jesus. So we could finally come at last to know what God is like. John said, no one has ever seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is, the, who is at the Father's side. He, is, he, he has revealed him. Then in John number 1 it says, He became flesh, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word become flesh. So the whole point that I want to make, or say the main point of the incarnation, is at long last we know what God is like. We know what God is like because God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. And if we think at some point in, in, in the past that God was not like Jesus, then we're mistaken. God is like Jesus. So what Jesus did, that is God, okay? That is God. But getting God right, that is the understanding God correctly, has been an enormous complication for the human race. It is complicated for the human race. We haven't done very well at that. What we tend to do, we tend to unconsciously, I think, to form God in our own image. We want to form God in our own image, not, not to be informed, we're informed in His image. We want to form God in our image, okay? How many of you know there's a difference between man being formed in the image of God, which is our identity and our vocation? We've talked about that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He said, we were created in the likeness and the image of God. So our identity is we are created in, in the likeness of God, and our vocation is to take dominion. He said, I give you dominion and authority over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field, and everything that creeps. So our identity is we are, we are we're, we're, we're created in the, in the likeness of God, and our vocation is to take dominion, to take charge. Amen? That's what he's called us to do. Now, how many of you know there are differences, again, between being formed in the image of God, which is our identity and vocation, and God being formed in the image of man, which is, which is idolatry? That's idolatry, okay? Now, they've done some studies in some universities and how they ask people what God thinks about various issues. And it always reveals that God shares all of their opinions. Now, listen to this. You can tell that you're, you're, you can tell that you're very far down the road to create, to creating God in, in your own image. And that's what people want to do. They want to create God in their image. They want God to be like them instead of them being like God, okay? They want to be the, 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 just the other way God. So anyhow, God does not change. God does not evolve, but our understanding of God may change or it may evolve. God is like Jesus, and what is Jesus like? God is like Jesus, and Jesus is like the Beatitudes. Jesus is like the Beatitudes that we're ministering on here today. 
The Beatitudes form the ethics and the character and the personality and the motivation of Jesus. He is like the Beatitudes. To the degree that we don't understand the Beatitudes, to the same degree that we don't understand God or understand Jesus. How many of you in this study so far come to realize that the Beatitudes at times are hard to understand? They're kind of hard to understand. So Jesus is sometimes hard for me to understand. I don't know about you, but he's hard for me to understand sometimes. It's healthy for you to say that. It's easy to say, well, I've got Jesus all figured out. I know exactly how he is. Then you're stuck and you don't change. God is like Jesus and Jesus is like the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are counterintuitive. I've said that before. They're not the way that we tend to think. They're absolutely opposite of the way we, we tend to think, okay? All eight of them have a tendency to change the way that we ordinarily think. God is like Jesus, and Jesus is like these Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are counterintuitive. They're not the way that we think unless our minds get renewed with the Word of God. We need to have our minds renewed with the Word of God so that we're thinking like Jesus is thinking. Amen? The fifth beatitude says, blessed are the merciful, and Jesus is merciful. Amen? He is merciful, isn't he? He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He could have killed them all, okay? But he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, okay? He's, he's merciful. As you look at the portraits painted by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his mercy is prominent. It is prominent. You come to recognize Jesus as a merciful person, He's merciful to the sinners. He's merciful to the tax collectors. He's merciful to the prostitutes. He's merciful to Peter who said, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. But Jesus is merciful, and he is merciful to Matthew, who is the tax collector, and to merciful to Mary Magdalene, who is, and he is merciful to the woman caught in the act of adultery. The only people that Jesus was not merciful towards were those who were unmerciful. That's the only ones he wasn't merciful. The ones that were unmerciful, thus the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful. Why do the merciful receive mercy? The only people that Jesus was not merciful towards were those who committed the sin of showing no mercy. He wasn't merciful to those that were, that was a sin. They weren't showing any mercy. It's fair to say that Jesus was merciful to sinners with one exception. Those who show no mercy. If you show no mercy, you will receive no mercy. So we better show some mercy up in here. Amen? So here's my advice to you. If you're going to be a sinner, pick something, some other sin other than being unmerciful, okay? Don't pick that sin because if you do, you be in trouble, okay? You've got a problem with Jesus. So the sin of showing no mercy will put you in a position and you will have a problem. So we, got, we have to show mercy. Now, let's put the fourth and the fifth Beatitudes together. We're going to put them together. Remember a couple of weeks ago, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Rightness for the world to be made right. Everybody wants the world to be made right, right? Everybody wants the world to be made right. Now, there's no Greek word today. Bless God, no Greek word for number five, okay? But blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. That's what it said in, in, the, in the fourth beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, when you put number four and number five together, you get a deliberate echo of Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Look at that scripture, Micah 6, 8, which is a summary of the prophetic tradition. Right here it says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with God. So we hear the summary of this prophetic tradition in Micah 6, 8, and Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, and blessed are the merciful. In other words, they go together. They have to go together. Because if you do not hold the fourth and fifth together uh, <clears throat> in tension, things sort of, sort of go awry. So you've you got you to gotta put those two Beatitudes together. If not, things will go awry. For example, without the commitment for justice, mercy can disintegrate into cheap sentimentality, okay? Just been a nice person. Well, he's just a nice person. 
it comes like we're going to be terribly nice people. We want to be nice people, all right? But we, you know, but we have to put mercy and justice together. And that's not, re that's, that's not really what's being said here. And mercy to be added to doesn't stand by itself. It stands in tension with the, uh, the justice beatitude. In other words, they go together. So we learned a couple of weeks ago, Jesus said, Blessed are those who yearn and ache, who long for justice and righteousness. They long for things to be made right. How many of you have a passion for the world gone wrong to be made right? We all want the world to go right, right? We don't want the world to go wrong. We want the, the world to seek after Jesus, amen, to do justice and to walk humbly with God. That's what we want. Amen? Now, that's, that's good. And Jesus blesses that. But think about it. As long as justice of the world is to be made right, there is disagreement in what constitutes justice. Individually, we have disagreements in what constitutes justice. How many of you know the world is wrong? The world is wrong. It is totally wrong. How many of you know America is kind of broken? Americans kind of broken. How many of you have an idea how to, to be made right? How many of you know not everybody agrees with your idea? They do not. They do not agree with your idea. Now, let's just take a moment to talk about a topic in America, the issue of health care. Now, relax. I'm not going to talk about it except in, in a, sort of a general sense, okay? Health care. Some people say this. Some people say that. Some people say, well, it's a responsibility of the government to have universal health care for all. And they will make a very compelling argument for them. They say, that is justice. It's the right thing to do. Everybody got to have health care. That's just the right thing to do. Others will make another compelling argument, just as sincere as that, that it's not the role of the government, it's not, and it's not justice, and it's not right. So as long as we yearn for justice, we have to remember that not everyone has an identical opinion on what amounts to righteousness or right, righteousness or justice. And this is where we need mercy. We need mercy, okay? <laughs> we need the mercy of God. We need it. Because passion for justice can become a vicious battleground where people get hurt and even separates good friends. Have you ever been separated from a good friend because of political issues? Well, sure, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That's why we need mercy. We need mercy, not just justice, the long arm of the law. We need the mercy of God. In other words, people fight about competing ideas concerning justice. The only people that fight about political things are people who already are doing the fourth beatitude because they hunger and thirst for things to be made right. Some people don't have enough yearning or aching or passion to fight about it, but people that really are passionately yearn for things to be made right, and they have a vision or an idea of what constitutes the world being made right. And if we're not very careful, we will engage in a very bitter conflict with people around them who may, in fact, have an equal commitment for justice but a different idea of what it is. They have a different idea of what justice really is. When the longing of justice banishes, when the longing for justice banishes mercy. <laughs> if all you want is justice, you're going to banish mercy, okay? We have, to, we, we have to abandon that if we're going to walk the Jesus way. We've got to have justice and we have to have mercy. As Christians... We must long, thirst, and ache for justice. That's clear. That is the fourth beatitude. But if our longing and yearning and aching for justice banishes mercy, we have abandoned the Jesus way. And I want to go the Jesus way. Amen? I don't want to go just beatitude number four. I want to go beatitude and beatitude number four and five mixed together. Okay? That's why the Jesus followers need to be merciful as they hunger and thirst for justice because justice without mercy is cruelty. Let me say that again. Justice without mercy is cruelty. And that's not like God because God is like Jesus. So we have to live in the tension of a longing for justice, but at the same time, we must be merciful. It's the two poles. 
they're not opposed to one another, but they have different emphasis. Mercy and justice, so we have to do justice, and we have to love mercy, and we have to hunger and yearn for, uh, for justice, but we have to be merciful. In our dealings with people, we have to be merciful. And sometimes it's hard to do. It is hard to do, for sure. We live in that tension. We're not the same as everybody else. But as, as you live between these two poles, justice and mercy, sometimes it's very clear that in this moment I should push for justice, in this moment I should push for mercy. How many of you understand sometimes it's not clear what we should do? When in doubt, listen, lean towards mercy, okay? When in doubt, lean towards mercy. That's just me being kind to you and telling you to do that. Now, here's how this game works. Listen to this. When it comes time to judge you, you, you are judged in mercy according to position of mercy that has been given to others, okay? So you'll be judged in mercy as you've given mercy to others. So we better have mercy if we want to receive mercy, amen? If you give a little mercy to others and you're a strict justice, you're the law and order kind of person, Jesus won't put up with that very long, okay? If your attitude and you find yourself over the line, now it's time for you to be judged, and that's the standard. We don't tolerate that much around here, okay? So we have to have justice and mercy coming together. But if we tend to be kind, the kind of person that sees from the, this point of view, in other words, we don't know the whole story, and most of the time we don't know the truth. You know, we tend to judge things when we don't know the whole truth. If you don't know the whole truth, you will be in trouble. Amen? Yeah. If you don't know the whole truth, you'll get in trouble. I just saw that on Facebook the other day. We were bragging about the boat, you know. And it says, oh, no, no the boat's not paid for. The boat is paid for. They didn't know it. They are saying, oh, no, it's paid for. That's a lie. What do you mean that's a lie? They didn't know the truth. So they were judging on something because they didn't know the truth, that the boat was paid in full, the boat and the engine, bless God. But see, they didn't know that, and so they, they made this little statement and said, no, that's not true, it's not paid for. Yes, it is paid for. So we have to know the truth before we start uh, judging a, a, an issue, okay? So you could find, a, or you could be the kind of person that defaults towards mercy, and you'll say, well, who am I to judge? And that's really pretty. That's a pretty good attitude. You don't have to have an opinion about everything and everybody. All right, I just want to liberate you. Let my people go. All right, let my people go. It's okay to say, well, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that. It's none of my business. I don't have to judge them. Maybe you would say things like, well, if I were in their shoes, uh, who who would know what I would do? Which is part of what the incarnation is all about. Jesus got into our skin, and he knows what it's like in the situations that we're in. He knows what it's like to be us. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, he is a merciful high priest. So we must be merciful. If we're going to receive mercy, we have to, we have to give mercy. Because he's taken on the flesh and blood. He knows what it's like. Unless you know what it's like to be that other person, you need to pull back and say, well, I don't know. I haven't been in their shoes. I'm not sure how I would react. See, here it is. Here's how it works with judgment. We tend to judge others. Listen to this. We tend to judge others according to our intentions. We intend to judge others according to our intentions, and we judge others according to their actions. <laughs> So we say to ourselves, well, I messed up, but I meant well. My heart was in the right place. You've heard people say, well, God knows my heart, okay? You've heard people say that. If you could see my heart, you would know that I'm, I'm just trying to help you. When I called you an idiot, my heart was in the right place. <laughs> That's how we judge others. But judge others by saying, I don't know, I don't know what they did, I just know that actions speak louder than words. So it's a double standard, judging others according to their action and judging yourself according to your intentions, okay? <laughs> we judge others according to their actions, and we judge ourselves according to our intentions. Well, I meant well, 
I think maybe we should say, well, I think they meant well because we live in a cruel world that needs mercy. You know that? We live in a cruel world that needs mercy. Can anybody say yes to that? We say amen to that. This cruel world needs more mercy. Where, where can this cruel world find more mercy if not in the followers of Jesus? We are followers of Jesus, so we should be high on the mercy list. Who can confess that the Beatitude says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I want to receive mercy. So therefore, I want to give mercy. Now, if you're not finding mercy from us, where is this cruel world going to find mercy? If, if the world's not finding mercy, but where is this cruel world going to find it? They, they can't find it if they don't find it from followers of Jesus. That's why I say, if our protest heritage, heritage prevents us from being people of God's mercy, the, we have betrayed the name of a Christian, which means Christ-like or like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus, amen? I want to be like Jesus. That's why we're studying these Beatitudes, because Beatitudes represents Jesus. This is the personality of Jesus. Because God is like Jesus, and Jesus is like the Beatitudes, simply put. Speaking of this cruel world in need of more mercy, I wish someone would write something, an essay or something on Christian ethics for the Internet. Okay, because why do we say it's, why do we say it's permissible that Jesus follows that the only people, and that's the only people that I'm addressing is Jesus followers. I'm not addressing anybody else. I'm not addressing the world, but I'm... I'm talking about Jesus followers that are on the Internet, all right? Why are Jesus followers or disciples think it's permissible to identify those who disagree with their view of justice and call them idiots and fools and even worse than that, all right? They do that on the, on the Internet. These are followers of Jesus. I know you could do, do that in a conversation, but it seems more egregious when a person hides behind a keyboard and calls people's names, all right? Okay? Now, am I the only one that's noticed that? <laughs> if you go on the internet, you're going to find it, okay? You're going to find it. Now, what do you, why do you think it's okay? Because we think God is on our side. Because I've found something in the Bible that I think all Christian bloggers have overlooked. Now, look at this scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. And I think these Christian bloggers have overlooked this. Now, it's in red, so we know it's what Jesus said. He says, you have heard that is said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Ooh, watch yourself <laughs> and shake yourself, okay? <laughs> So remember, this is the red letters. So if we're going to get involved in red letter living, we're going to have to scale back our name calling. And not just to strut about and say, well, a God agrees with all of my opinions, you idiot. And that's what people do on, online, all right? Now, how is it that we come to admire those involved in the art of put-downs? You know, we love that. Jesus is not imp impressed with that. He says, that's not, my follow not what my followers do. So the question is, are we people of mercy? Here's the question. Are we really people of mercy? Do people say, I've blown it. I really need to get, get around those Christians. I know that they, they will have mercy on me. And people do that, okay? We've been known for our protests and our politics, which now, listen, I'm going to be merciful, okay? We've been known for our politics, but now I'm going to be merciful. That's what people say now which is the best form of, of, of which is the best form is a passion for justice Jesus in the previous Beatitudes he endorses that he endorses passion for justice he wants us to be just people he wants justice to be a part of us okay now but I'm going to say this in this in the same breath right now I feel like it might do a world of good for us not so much to be known for justice but we should be known for the mercy that we extend to others. There needs to be justice, but there needs to be mercy extended to others. Now, this message is about getting, is about to get interesting if it hasn't been so far, all right? Fear not, it's going to get no more interesting. 
because we're going to do something. I'm going to bring a contemporary issue, way of examining ourselves. And Dr. Rick's going to like this, okay? It's going to, he's going to like this one, all right? Tiger Woods is going to be our, our topic for the next few minutes. Tiger Woods, the greatest golfer in the world, man. The greatest golfer in the world, amen? At one time, Tiger Woods equaled the greatest golfer, and that was it. Now, if I say Tiger Woods, golf isn't the first thing that we think about a few years ago. Remember this? A few years ago, Tiger Woods gave a televised apology. I watched it in detail. He walked out. He was nervous like you wouldn't, like you, like you wouldn't be, and he gave an apology. Then the analysis begins. We have experts and commentators and bloggers, people that are analyzing what he said. So, so Fred, do you think that he was sincere? Okay, do you think he was really sincere? I don't think he was, he said. The process of evaluating or biblical word of, of judging the society of his apology was now underway. As you know, as if you have the capacity to look at a man's heart and know whether he's sincere or not. We cannot look at a person's heart and know whether he's sincere or not. Okay, we can't do that. We cannot do that. Now, that is a motive of the heart that we're totally incapable of judging. But many seem to re revel in, in Tiger's downfall. Many people revel in his downfall. Many people think, if he can stay down, then I'm on top. In other words, I have moral superiority over Tiger Woods. If he can stay down, that means I'm going up, all right? I think, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this man, this man, especially Tiger Woods. That's some people's thought of it. I, I'm thinking I'm not like him, okay? Because he's a serial adulterer, and not just one or two, but apparently a lot. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like he is. Now I'd like for you to believe that none of these people were Christians, okay? that judging the sincerity of the apology of another. But I know better. I know some of these people were judging him were Christians, all right? Many Christians said things like this. Well, he just got caught. The only reason he's given an apology is he got caught. I would say, sure, sure. Is that what we say when King David got caught? Remember King David? Remember King David? Got caught in the act of adultery. He tried to cover it up with murder. Let's not go easy on King David. Adultery tried to cover it up. His best general, this, this scandal of biblical proportion. And he repented, but after all, he got caught. I never heard a Christian say, King David, he only repented because he got caught. I would say none of us would repent unless the Holy Ghost catches us, okay? We have a nice term for that. It's called conviction of the Holy Ghost, okay? Conviction. It's getting caught by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost says, you're busted. You are busted. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. And answer this within your heart. I don't want you to raise your hand and tell me. In your heart, all right? Question number one, how did you judge Tiger Woods in your heart? I'm really thinking especially after the apology came. Did you find yourself thinking he didn't mean it? He was not sincere. He was just trying to recover his endorsement contract. Second question. Did you judge Tiger Woods? In other words, did you actually talk to your friends and, and, or then get on the Internet? What is it you think that Jesus is talking about? He said, your word shall be justified, and by your word you shall be condemned. ruh -roh. okay? Do you think he was talking about stuff like this? What if how you judge Tiger Woods is exactly how God is going to judge you? Now think about this for a minute. What if how you judge the sincerity of his apology is how God is going to judge the sincerity of your apology? Listen, we've all done things that we need to apologize for, for sure. What if God's attitude towards repentance was exactly the same as your attitude towards Tiger's apology? Do you want God to turn around to the angel and say, that idiot? <laughs> oh, Lord, no, okay? He just got caught. I know he says he's sorry, but if he hadn't got caught, would he... Would, would he still be doing it? Idiot. Is that what you want? Maybe this whole thing was just a test case for us. Maybe this whole thing was just a test case for us. We don't know if it's a test. Well, we thought it was all about Tiger Woods when this happened. 
Maybe it was a pop quiz from God for all of us. We didn't even know that we were taking a test. Now I'm telling you, what we just went through was a test. If you're thinking about it, if you're saying, God is testing me, am I a judgmental or am I a merciful person? Are you a judgmental person or are you a merciful person? Well, I'm a merciful person. When I think about it, what about when you're not thinking about it, okay? I'm talking about somebody like this. Did you share this view on this? See, they were passionate about this when this was going on. They said, you can't be saved by apologizing. You have to repent and believe on Jesus. You're not saved by apologizing, which I completely agree with. But that's not what I said. I'm not trying to save Tiger Woods. I'm trying to save you, all right? <laughs> Tiger Woods isn't here. Tiger Woods has never heard of me and probably never will. It's you that I'm trying to talk about saving. You're saying, well, I don't believe that he can get saved like that. All he did was issue an apology and talk about being a Buddhist, and that's what he did. He can't get saved like that. And I said, I'm not trying to save Tiger Woods. I'm just trying to save you from being a judgmental person because there are consequences for this, okay? There are consequences. It didn't go over. They, they don't ever hear you when you talk about that. Now, what we do is this. We make certain, we make saved as com a completely accomplished task that is forever settled in a safety deposit box in heaven. Don't even bother with that. I'm saved, man, I'm saved. You know, it's in a deposit box in heaven, okay? We, we make that. I'm saved, darn it, I'm saved, idiot, I'm saved, you know, I am saved. What about the things that we talk about? The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Where do we put that? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I'm saved from going to hell when I die. Okay, but are you saved from being, are you saved from being judgmental? Are you saved from being judgmental today? What does that have to do with it? Everything. Again, this is not about saving Tiger Woods. This is about you. This is not a message about Tiger Woods' salvation. This is a message about our salvation, about you being saved from being judgmental. That's why I like the ancient Orthodox prayer that was born in the Egyptian, uh, in the Egyptian desert 1,600 years ago. And it's known as the Jesus Prayer, and I've said this before. Here is the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Say it with me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's almost a perfect prayer. First, it's a confession of faith in who Jesus is. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. It's a great confession of faith that identifies who Jesus is. He is Lord. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. And at the end of the prayer, we, we identify ourselves as sinners. And in between, just one petition, we have mercy. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. It's a petition of one thing, mercy, the mercy of God, because that's one thing that we all need. We need the mercy of God. We need it. What you really want is the mercy of God. Because if you have the mercy of God, someone might say, well, I've lost it all. But I have the mercy of God, you're going to be all right. If you got the mercy of God upon your life, you're going to be all right. If you have the mercy of God. See, these things are not, is not giving mercy. Let me say it again. If all you have is the mercy of God. See, this thing about not giving mercy is related to the sin of pride. People that do not have mercy, that is the sin of pride. Showing no mercy is the fruit of the root of pride. Say that again. Is the fruit of the root of pride. Because we show no mercy when we think we're above the need of mercy for ourselves. Listen, we all need mercy. Amen. If we think we don't need mercy, you're in trouble. Well, I don't need mercy. I'm a good person. I'm a right person. I'm righteous. I just don't need mercy. That's another way of saying I don't need a Savior. That's what that's saying. People that don't need mercy don't need a Savior. 
They may say they do. They understand those rules of the game, but they live it out, and they see themselves as having a Savior for 20 years, but haven't needed one since. That's worse than sin, because people that, that Jesus is unmerciful towards are those that are unmerciful. Those that are unmerciful. And if you're backslidden long enough, you're out of church long enough, you will become unmerciful, and you are in trouble, brother. You are in trouble. We need one another. We need one another. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Cursed are the unmerciful, for they shall not receive mercy. I want the mercy of God upon my life. The only reason you could be unmerciful is because you don't think you need mercy. And the only reason you don't think you need mercy is because you are proud. So humble yourself and you say, God, be merciful to be a sinner. You say the, you say the, the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. You cannot pray a better prayer than that. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Now, I've decided to have a communion today. Because this table up here represents mercy. This table represents the mercy of God. It's a table of grace. It's a table of forgiveness. Jesus said at this table at night that he was betrayed. After supper, he said he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this, this cup is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. In just a minute, we're going to pray. And I'm going to invite you to come to this table. Who may come to this table? All who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God that died for your sins and was raised to life again. If you believe that Jesus Christ is risen Son of God, you come to this table, you eat of this bread, you drink of this cup, and you eat and drink mercy. You eat and drink mercy. As you come with humility, admit, I'm a sinner, I'm in need of grace. As you come with this prayer on your lips, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When you eat and drink, you eat and drink mercy of yourself. Just hold it right there, and I'm going to have them come and get it, okay? As you eat this bread, you are fellowshipping in the body of Christ. As you drink this cup, you are fellowshipping with the body of Christ. And in his broken body and his shed blood is the communion or the communication of mercy to you. This is God's mercy towards us today. This is his mercy towards us today. Let everybody just stand.